Hi, welcome back to The Basement. I'm Steve Lewis. Today's episode picks up where episode 170, U.S. Pop Culture 1964, part 4, left off. We've reached the third quarter of the year, the months of July, August, and September. In this episode, we'll look at music, movies, and news. Next time, we'll look at television and the Beach Boys, ahead of our discussion of the Beach Boys All Summer Long album, which of course was released in the third quarter of 1964. Let's come up to speed with a look at music. And on that first album chart of the quarter, July 4th, 1964, Hello Dolly by Louis Armstrong was in the fifth of seven weeks at number one. At number two was the original cast recording of Hello Dolly, one of two albums still in the top ten from the end of the prior quarter. It had hit number one on June 6th. At number three was the Funny Girl cast recording featuring Barbara Streisand, which had spent the first three weeks of June at number three. The Beatles' second album was at number four. It had followed Meet the Beatles into the number one spot on May 2nd and stayed there for five weeks. At number five was the third album by Barbara Streisand, still in the top ten from the beginning of the second quarter and in the second of two weeks at its number five peak. Al Hurt's Cotton Candy was in the second of two weeks at its number six peak. The Gates' Gilberto album was at number seven. It will eventually reach number two for two weeks beginning August 8th. At number eight was the Academy Award-winning Call Me Irresponsible and other hit songs from the movies by Andy Williams. It had gone to number five for the first three weeks of June. At number nine was Glad All Over by the Dave Clark Five, which had hit number three on May 23rd. And at number 10 was Today, Tomorrow, Forever by Nancy Wilson in the second of its three weeks at number 10. And on the first singles chart of the quarter, reaching number one was the Beach Boys' I Get Around. It was the group's first number one single, and it will remain number one next week, July 11th. Of course, we'll talk much more about this when we discuss the Beach Boys all summer long. At its number two peak was My Boy Lollipop by Millie Small. Millie Small, born Millicent Smith, was a Jamaican singer. As you can see on the label, she was also billed as the Blue Beat Girl. Though it was largely viewed as kind of a novelty hit, the song is considered the first ska, blue beat, or early reggae record to hit it big in the U.S. The song also reached number two in England in the spring of 64. In the U.K., it was licensed to Fontana Records. Though it's uncredited on the label, the record was produced by Englishman Chris Blackwell. Blackwell, a champion of Jamaican music, had founded Island Records in 1958. Later, his Island label would be key to the overseas success of Jamaican acts like Toots and the Maytals and Bob Marley and the Whalers, along with the success of English rock acts like Traffic, King Crimson, Emerson, Lake, and Palmer, Roxy Music, and many, many others. At number three was Johnny Rivers with a cover of Chuck Berry's Memphis. It'll go to number two for two weeks beginning July 11th. Don't Let the Sun Catch You Crying by Jerry and the Pacemakers was in the first of two weeks at its number four peak. Barbara Streisand's People was in the second of two weeks at its number five peak. Peter and Gordon's A World Without Love, penned by Lennon and McCartney, mostly McCartney actually, was at number six. It had hit number one a week earlier, just before I Get Around. At number seven was Chapel of Love by the Dixie Cups. It was on Redbird Records, a label founded by famed songwriters Lieber and Stoller, with business partner George Goldner. We talked about Goldner back in episode 168, Shut Down Volume 2, Part 2, as the man who signed Frankie Lyman and the Teenagers and took co-writing credit on Why Do Fools Fall in Love. As you can see, this record has Redbird catalog number 001. It got the label off to a great start. It had been number one for three weeks beginning June 6th. As we'll see, Redbird will also have top 10 hits in 1964 with the Jelly Beans and the Shangri-Las, as well as some more minor hits, most written or co-written by Jeff Berry and Ellie Greenwich. The label will crash and burn in spectacular early rock and roll style in 1966, with Lieber and Stoller reportedly selling their interest to Goldner for $1 to get out of it, when allegedly Goldner's gambling debts caused the label to be taken over by some allegedly very unsavory characters. At number eight on that first singles chart of July was Ragdoll by The Four Seasons. It'll follow I Get Around to number one on July 18th for two weeks. At number nine was Bad to Me by Billy J. Kramer and the Dakotas. 
another one written by Lennon and McCartney, this one mostly by Lennon. It was the USB side of their hit Little Children. This will do almost as well as the number 7 A side had. It was in the second of its two weeks at number 9. And at number 10 was Can't You See That She's Mine by the Dave Clark Five. It'll peak at number 4 on July 18th. Top 10 singles that will come and go in the third quarter included Chuck Berry's No Particular Place to Go, which will peak at number 10 on July 11th. It was Berry's first top 10 hit since Johnny Be Good in 1958, and his last apart from the number one My Dingaling in 1972. Berry's career was also getting a boost from so many British invasion groups, including the Beatles, covering his songs. Gates and Gilberto's The Girl from Ipanema will go to number five for two weeks beginning July 18th. Keep on Pushing by The Impressions will be number 10 for two weeks beginning July 18th. A Hard Day's Night by The Beatles will be number one for the first two weeks of August. The Little Old Lady from Pasadena by Jan and Dean will go to number three on August 1st. Written by Don Altfeld and Brian Wilson's frequent collaborator Roger Christian, it was their third top 10 hit of 1964 and, as it transpired, the last top 10 hit of their career. Dusty Springfield's Wishing and Hopin' will be number six for three weeks beginning August 1st. Dang Me by Roger Miller, his first time in the top 40 and the first of what will become a long string of mildly comic country style hits will peak at number seven on August 1st. I Wanna Love Him So Bad by The Jelly Beans will hit number nine for two weeks beginning August 8th. It's another girl group hit from the new Redbird label. Everybody loves somebody by Dean Martin will go all the way to number one on August 15th. After being absent from the top 40 since 1958, Dean Martin was back in a big way in 1964. Though he'd been charting hits as far back as 1948, this will be his second number one after memories are made of this back in 1955. Though they'd had a number 23 hit back in January, Where Did Our Love Go is the Supreme's big breakthrough. It'll be number one for two weeks beginning August 22nd and ultimately the beginning of a run of five consecutive number one hits. Under the boardwalk. Another great song from the Drifters will peak at number four on August 22nd. It will turn out to be the last top 10 hit for the group. Walk Don't Run 64 by The Ventures will go to number eight for two weeks beginning August 22nd. Bobby Freeman's Come On and Swim, one of the last of the diminishing breed of dance craze records, will spend two weeks at number five beginning August 29th. The Animals' House of the Rising Sun shot from number 60 to number 10 in its second week on the chart. It's a folk tune played in a heavy rock style and will of course be highly influential on much of what's to come in 60s rock. It'll hit number one on September 5th and stay there for three weeks. Also hitting in the summer of 64 was How Do You Do It by Jerry and the Pacemakers. Back in 1962, producer George Martin had chosen the song for the A-side of the Beatles' first single. Much to the relief of the Beatles, it was dropped eventually in favor of a Lennon and McCartney original, Love Me Do. The Beatles' version will remain unreleased until the 1990s. George Martin instead used the song for Jerry and the Pacemakers' debut record. It'll go to number nine in the U.S. on September 5th, 1964. Because by the Dave Clark Five was their fifth U.S. hit and their biggest so far. It'll go to number three on September 12th. In big new album releases, on July 13th, we got the Beach Boys All Summer Long album. More about this, of course, in an upcoming episode. On July 20th came Something New by The Beatles, the third U.S. Beatles album on Capitol. It was originally scheduled for August 1st and Rush released to compete with the Hard Day's Night soundtrack on United Artist, which United Artist had Rush released on June 26th. It was comprised of three of the four new songs from the U.K. Hard Day's Night album that hadn't been released in the U.S., Five of the eight tracks from the United Artist Hard Day's Night album, Slow Down, Matchbox, and the German version of I Want to Hold Your Hand. On July 24th, Peter, Paul, and Mary's In Concert album was released. Also released in July was the Four Seasons Ragdoll album. It'll go to number seven on September 19th. The Beatles Songbook by the Holly Ridge Strings, an early attempt to translate Beatles songs into adult-oriented, serious arrangements. It'll go to number 15. 
Also in July, trumpeter Al Hurt followed up his 1964 top 10 albums Honey in the Horn and Cotton Candy with Sugar Lips. This one will hit the top 10 as well, peaking at number 9 for the last two weeks of November. Also released in July, Keep On Pushing by The Impressions. 11 of the album's 12 tracks were written by their leader, young Curtis Mayfield. And country star Jim Reeves, The Best of Jim Reeves, released coincidentally right around the time of his death in a plane crash in Tennessee on July 31st. The album will go to number 9 on November 14th. Released on August 4th was Dream with Dean by Dean Martin. It'll go to number 15 based on the inclusion of Everybody Loves Somebody, though this is not the hit version. Also released in August was Everybody Loves Somebody by Dean Martin, a compilation of B-sides and album tracks along with the hit single. Also released in August, It Might As Well Be Swing by Frank Sinatra with Count Basie, another successful collaboration following up on last year's hit Sinatra Basie album. This one will go to number 13 in the fall. And American Tour by the Dave Clark Five, which, despite its title, is their third U.S. studio album. It'll peak at number 11. Nancy Wilson's How Glad I Am album was released in August, as was the Chipmunks Sing the Beatles Hits. It'll reach number 14. On August 31st, the Supreme's Where Did Our Love Go album was released. In September, joining the British Invasion of the Beatles, the Dave Clark Five, and the Rolling Stones with albums hitting the top 15 in the U.S., comes The Animals with their self-titled collection featuring their seminal hit, The House of the Rising Sun. The album will go to number 7 for three weeks beginning October 31st. Also released in September was The Cat by Jimmy Smith, an album of swingin' jazz arrangements by Lalo Schifrin featuring Jimmy Smith on the Hammond B3 organ. It'll reach number 12. People by Barbara Streisand, which has a very nice and in retrospect very modern looking album cover. Also in September, The Kingsman Volume 2, which will go to number 15 late in the year, and Bobby Vinton's Greatest Hits. And released right around this time was the soundtrack to the new Disney movie, Mary Poppins. In August, the Beatles returned to the U.S. for the first time since their arrival in February. On that first visit, outside of appearances on The Ed Sullivan Show, they had played a total of three concerts. One in Washington, D.C. on February 11th, and two at Carnegie Hall in New York on February 12th. Now, six months into Beatlemania, they were back for their first proper North American concert tour. The tour will comprise 32 dates, starting in San Francisco on August 19th and ending in New York on September 20th. Obviously, this is the first opportunity most Americans have to see them. And in movies in the third quarter of 64, released on July 22nd was AIP's Bikini Beach, starring Frankie Avalon and Annette Funicello, with Frankie in another of those dual roles that seem so popular in movies this year. This time, he was his usual surf and sing and Frankie character, and also a Terry Thomas-inspired English character who is a rock star known as the Potato Bug. The Potato Bug is also, coincidentally, a drag racer, hitting the the 1964 teen trifecta of surfing, drag racing, and English rock and rollers. Also released on July 22nd was Marnie, Alfred Hitchcock's suspenseful sex mystery starring Tippi Hedren and Sean Connery. On August 4th, we got Night of the Iguana, a drama starring Richard Burton, Ava Gardner, Deborah Kerr, and Sue Lyon. It'll be number one at the box office the week of August 12th. On August 5th, not a huge release, but somewhat notable for Beach Boy fans, Ride the Wild Surf, a non-AIP entry into the beach party genre, which featured Jan and Dean's title song at the end of the film. The song was written by Jan Barry, Roger Christian, and Brian Wilson. The film starred Fabian, Shelley Febre, Tab Hunter, Susan Hart, and Barbara Eden. We'll talk more about this in an upcoming episode. The song will be Jan and Dean's next single, released on August 26th, and it'll be the title track of their next album, released on September 28th. More about that next time. On August 11th came the U.S. release of the Beatles movie A Hard Day's Night. It surprised nearly everybody by getting good reviews from many serious adult critics. Most people expected a quick slapdash effort to cash in before the Beatle fad faded out, something between a beach party movie and an Elvis movie. 
It may have been made quickly, but it was original, funny, and energetic. Without pandering to an older audience, even adults could watch the movie without embarrassment and enjoy the experience. For a lot of, especially younger people, it felt like the Beatles had captured some kind of energy that the rest of us hadn't found but definitely wanted part of. Released on August 12th was Jerry Lewis in The Patsy. And on August 27th came Disney's Mary Poppins, starring Julie Andrews and Dick Van Dyke in a mostly live-action film with some animation. It'll be a huge hit and number one at the box office for the weeks of October 28th and November 11th. And released on September 2nd was Top Cappy, a crime caper comedy set in Istanbul, which will be number one at the box office the week of October 21st. And turning to news in the third quarter of the year, on July 2nd, in a ceremony carried live on all three networks, President Johnson signs the Civil Rights Act outlawing a long list of racial discrimination in employment, education, and housing, and segregation in all public places. On July 15th, Arizona Senator Barry Goldwater becomes the Republican nominee for president. Goldwater captures the nomination on the first ballot, marking a more conservative turn for the Republican Party. On August 7th, the Vietnam conflict deepens as Congress gives President Johnson greater authority to strike against North Vietnam after communist boats reportedly attack U.S. ships in the Gulf of Tonkin. The Vietnam War begins to escalate. From August 24th through August 27th, the Democrats hold their national convention in Atlantic City. As expected, President Johnson is nominated. As his running mate for vice president, Johnson chooses Minnesota Senator Hubert Humphrey. On the last night of the convention, the late President Kennedy's brother, Attorney General Robert Kennedy, takes the podium to introduce a short film on his brother's legacy. In an emotional turn, the crowd erupts into 22 minutes of uninterrupted applause. On September 24th, the Warren Commission releases its report on the assassination of President Kennedy 10 months earlier. The commission concludes that there was no conspiracy and that Lee Harvey Oswald acted alone. And on September 28th, Harpo Marx passes away at the age of 75. He's survived by his wife of 28 years, four children, and brothers Groucho, Gummo, and Zeppo. And we'll leave it there for this week. Hope you found this interesting. I look forward to your comments. Please join us next time for a very eventful third quarter in television. And we'll also look at what the Beach Boys were up to. Then the week after, we will begin our discussion of the All Summer Long album. Thanks again for watching. Have a great week. Bye.